Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Super Fantify. This finger show where I talk about TV shows of the supernatural fantasy and or science fictional genre. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about season slash series one of Cursed. Uh, right off the bat, I'm going to let you know I'm going to be jumping straight into spoilers. So if you have not seen all of season one slash series one of Cursed, do not listen to this because, like I said, there will be spoilers. You have been warned. First off, in general, how I felt about the season, I thought it was great. Obviously, I went into this not knowing. For one, I've never read the original uh, novel that this is based on. Plus, I am not that familiar with Arthurian lore. I know some stuff here and there. Once again, a lot of my knowledge comes from Merlin, the TV show from a couple years ago. To be fair, I have not seen it in a couple years, so a lot of that knowledge kind of faded. But there, like, there's little things here and there. Uh, Excalibur, Arthur, Merlin, those are things I know little tidbits about just because, you know, they're just almost like those pop culture things you just kind of know just because it's been adapted so many times. Um, I also thought it was kind of interesting that they never actually referred to the sword as Excalibur. I wonder if there like some, like, copywritten reasons why. I mean, they could probably, maybe the other names like fall under like certain like free domain where it's like Excalibur is such a like specific name. I mean, m m I mean to be fair, this, this I know the story that this is based on is like it takes Arthurian lore and it kind of remixes it. I think much like Merlin, the TV show, I think it did the same thing too. But regardless, I thought it was great. Obviously, following Nimue, I went into this thinking just like the Paladins were. The, like, obviously, didn't know at the time their names were the Red Paladins, but I thought they were the ones that just hated her. Turns out, like, sadly, even her own people hated her. Like the Sky Folk, like people were just kind of looking at her because of her. That's like, oh, because you're bad blood, because she was basically attacked by a dark god that bear that situation was scary like when she was like five years old and like she called upon the hidden and it ended up smiting i feel weird using such a old school word like smiting but it ended up killing that dark bear it was even more messed up because it disguised its voice as um pym that's why later on when the whole um kelly uh i'm gonna butcher its name because i keep hearing its name but i'm uh the kiliak the kaliak uh, that spider god thing the moment like morgana was on her own and she was hearing a voice i was like oh it's another dark god because it literally this the same thing literally happened to nimue when she was younger i, I figured i thought that was going to be the case but regardless um but you know i i like what her story ended up being um the fact of the matter is obviously we never i mean maybe i completely missed like what her role as a summoner was it's like oh you're a summoner but i guess it's like what she's able to do is a well because it seemed like she's able to do what she's able to do way before she became summoner but i guess summoner meant that you had to be the one to kind of take was that supposed to be like the next priestess or whatever is that what that was kind of implying but like her mom was a high priestess but like they used the term summoner so that makes me wonder what's our correlation like because the hidden and chosen her uh we never learned too much about the hidden i'm i mean it's supposed to it seems like it's basically like these beings i guess like either their ancestors or just ancient beings in general that are kind of hidden to i think you know they exist in everywhere they're kind of spirits that uh basically guide i think fey in general uh which i also appreciate they using the term fey like obviously when i think fey i immediately think of uh lost girls because that was the first show i ever saw that ever used that term to kind of represent like the more mystical side of things and that's what their people are um, obviously we get introduced to like different, you know, uh, groups over the course of the, uh, the other fate over the course of the series. But, um, it was just an interesting tale, especially like the sword and everything. It's like, oh, you're supposed to take it to Merlin. And that's what I was wondering. Cause I even brought it up when I was watching the trailer. I was like, is Merlin supposed to be a good guy or a bad guy? Cause I knew he wanted the sword. I was like, does he simply want the sword because he wants his magic back? Because the moment the sword was taken from him, all of his magic was gone. Uh, it was interesting even learning like over the course of the season, like the sword actually, and there's some, there's actually a lot of interesting things that they don't really tackle that I'm curious if they're ever going to answer. Like why the sword manifests the way it does. Like in the sense that like it popped up inside of Merlin, like, uh, Nimue's mom Lenore cut it out of him but because because when you look at it like earlier in the season like you see like there's like a sword like mark on the side of his body like I don't know whether it's always there or was it just in that moment him sensing the sword it just resonated um because it but once again, that was more so from the side. So it might have just been like almost like a, a phantom limb type of thing of just like the ache from like the sword being there. 
Uh, but I just thought that was, I'm wondering why, because it seemed like it never manifested itself like that until then. So why did it take on the form of the sword that entire time? But then we saw in the past, he did have the sword. So was it a situation that like he stored it away in his own body? I mean, why did it start killing him? Like, I guess maybe because he started, maybe he probably, he probably did hide the sword within himself. Like he probably did that on purpose. So Maybe the sword doesn't originate with Mer. Well, they make it. Well, it was formed from Fae Fire, but maybe I'm misremembering. But I don't know him ever expressly saying he's the one that made the sword. Like I said, maybe he did, and I just completely missed that. But it was just like, so he had to put it in himself because obviously, once again, we saw like when Nimue looked at its past, he was wounding the sword, mass murdering a lot of people. But I think it's because for him, it's just like it was too dangerous, and he couldn't stand holding it. So it's like I'm gonna keep it tucked away, and eventually it started killing him um it is interesting how it interacts with only certain people because it interacts the way it does with merlin but then later on it's like it makes sense why it interacts the way it does with nimue i like the twist of it being like oh he's your father because they kept bringing up stuff it's like oh it's in your blood it's in your blood it's because because you know merlin isn't he isn't classified as necessarily a fae i think he's a druid so i think he borderlines because it's not like he's half human half uh fae i think he is a f f uh, full-blown fae but obviously because he's in the fae's eyes he's always chosen the humans above of the above the fae so they look at him like that so but i just thought that was kind of an interesting element um even like cause once again like so, someone very limited authorian knowledge and this once again this is probably just uh the the book this is based on and the show itself doing the remixing but it's just so interesting to see merlin being like oh merlin wasn't always good you know because she's like you killed innocent people he's like and how many people have you killed that sword it's like he's like exactly you thought you were just in your calls i thought i was just in mine i was like that's so interesting because i guess for him it's just like especially i guess with his history with humans maybe it's a situation where he thought like oh those humans that what they because he always talks about the fact is he's the one that's kept the fae alive and yes the fae haven't had the most favorable position but it's like if it wasn't for me things would be so much worse that could be an instance of him being like i need to smite these humans before they become too powerful and get uh, you know we just still don't know too much about obviously a lot of uh merlin's past is kind of you know i mean he's been alive for a very 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 long time um but the whole situation with nimue i thought was kind of interesting uh, with what the sword does, I mean, especially like her like slicing through those wolves at the beginning, and I th and I think that was kind of a very impactful moment too to kind of recognize like that was obviously for survival, and they were animals. Like obviously she was still shaken, but when she murders all those red paladins later on, it was on a different level because like she saw what she had done and like she had sliced them. There was so much blood. It was it was different from killing a monster for survival and killing another person for survival. That was the first time she had ever done that. So you know. Because even in the past when she used... Well, yeah, because let's not forget, she defended herself when she was like five years old against that dark god. But still, you know, it was always against something else. This, These were humans. This was flesh and blood beings. It'd be like, just like, just like killing a fae would probably, you know, not sit well with her. Even though she sliced off home dude's hands at, uh, later in the season, you know. But she didn't kill him. She just sliced his hands off. Um, but I like that aspect of like the sword being very like coercive. Like it gets very intoxicating. But like it seems that's what I think is interesting because it's like it only seems like it's like that. I'm, it seems like it might like do that for other people. But the only people we really got to see it do that for was Merlin and Nimue. But it's like it's it only like that for Nimue because she's Merlin's blood. He kind of implies to make it seem like that. Um, but the fact of the because the fact of the matter is there have been other people. I mean, you can make the argument that maybe the sword did intoxicate Arthur a little bit. Uh, but, you know, maybe Morgana as well, because they're the ones that they're the only other people who've kind of wielded the sword, not really wielded it, but held it, you know. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting when she met Arthur, too, because like this, once again, Arthurian lore and stuff like that. I know about, like, oh, he who pulls his sword from the stone becomes king, like this whole Excalibur rule and everything. 
Uh, I wonder was that supposed to be like a wink and nod to that earlier in the season because when she's fighting the wolves at one point it gets stuck in the stone and she has to pull it out. I was like, is that supposed to be like a wink and nod to that or is that supposed to be very like foreshadowing or is it just going to be like, oh, we're never going to do the sword in the stone thing, but we're just going to wink and nod to it. Like, because that's the thing most people know. It's like, oh, the sword in the stone. Sure, people know that. So like that was probably like the only instance of that you get. Or maybe it'll eventually be like, oh no, the sword is going to be in the stone and it will do the whole like traditional thing of art, the tale of Arthur of like, oh, draw the sword from the stone. He who is, thy who is chosen type of situation. Because obviously it's like the whole thing in this, it's like, because I like the whole thing remixing it too. Like before Arthur became king, the sword chose a queen, you know, uh, because the sword is meant to obviously symbolize like it's meant to be like, oh, all those chosen by it kind of, you know, represent, um, are kind of it chooses the kings but even like and this kind of goes along with the point i was making earlier because merlin said like that sword corrupts everyone it's cursed you know so it isn't just him and nimue it does corrupt other people but like i said in, the argument could be maybe it did corrupt you know it whispered to arthur's inhibitions his his needs his wants you know to kind of answer that call i mean but the runes on it or whatever the symbols on it i'm, I'm just assuming they're runes uh i'm sure runes kind of fall in a different category uh but the, the symbols i'm assuming are face symbols resonate with nimue like they they don't it doesn't glow like that with anyone except for merlin too so it's like in a normal human hands i don't think anyone could ever fully bring out their power because i'm assuming like the sword's resonating with her powers and it's just because anytime she used her powers what she would she's very like because like because of how bloody things get at some point it kind of reminds me of like swamp thing the dc universe show how things got super bloody on a like on a eco level because it's like the tree at one point you see like the, the screen it quickly cuts away from it but like at one point one of the trees like stabs a dude through the face i was like that reminded me so much of swamp thing so that was just kind of what immediately hit my mind um how devastating it can be especially later on when that there's that dude that she didn't necessarily kill but like all those roots kind of grew from within him i was like oh that's that's gnarly um but it's like it's it seems like it just basically amplifies the power she already has because we've seen instances of what she's able to do but like obviously it's on a completely different level when she has the sword, like I said, it's like it just amplifies her power. And I thought it was kind of neat that her power isn't limitless. Like, it severely drains the hell out of her. Like, she could barely do a sword fight after, like, using, you know, a, a, using the sword to amplify her powers. It, like, drained the shit out of her to the point, like, like I said, against that dude she had to call upon that lady. She's like, give me your power, like, just to just to fend off that dude. So that just kind of shows you, like, how much of a disadvantage, you know, it ultimately ends up putting her at. Um... But um, circling to the whole Arthur situation, I thought it was interesting, like, how they kind of made him a bit of a dick. Once again, my knowledge of Merlin, the TV show, he was kind of a dick in that. Granted, he's much more of a dick in this just because – and it's interesting because, like, the whole pin dragon thing because, like, Uther typically like, – like I said, that just – because of the Merlin TV show, I, in my head, I guess I just assume, like, oh, he's a pin dragon – it's his right to claim the throne, but it's like, that's why he had to pull the sword from the stone in the first place, because he isn't of, like, a royal background, That so that might have been Merlin's own thing of, like, remixing it, so he's, t must, once again, I just, I guess I just never thought about it too much, but it's like, he is just some, like, commoner kid who ends up pulling the sword from the stone and becoming, like, oh, recognized as king, like, of course he doesn't come from, like, some high-privileged position like he does in the Merlin show, so I think I came into that with that preconceived notion, so him not being a pin dragon, I was like, oh, are you, like, a bad Bastard son or something it's like no in fact his dad was actually a knight but his dad like gained a lot of debts and so their family kind of fell from grace the whole complicated thing with his uncle because like the moment he took the sword and his sister could obviously we didn't know at the time that was morgana but she was like what are you going to do he's like honor a, a a dying wish the moment that happened i was like you're not honoring nimway's mom when you're saying that you're not going to take the sword of merlin you're going to and it's like the dying wish she was going to uh, get you know fulfill was his father like bring honor to our family and so he showed up to his uncle he wanted to kind of prove himself uh, he even, you know, but it seems like, you know, it's sad because, like, obviously we see early on, because, like, that's what confused me, because I was like, oh, he's like, oh, I'm a knight, but then, like, he gets treated like shit. I'm like, you know, he's, like, Pendragon's son, right? But, like I said, that's that was my misunderstanding and stuff like that, but it's like, no, he's not Uther's kid. So, it's like, he's just some lonely punk that's running with a whole bunch of, they're not knights, they're mercenaries, they're cutthroats, so it's like, um, it's just... It was, like, interesting to see that. And I think, obviously, that goes along with his tale just because, like, showing you, like, him rising above that, becoming 
a better person because of Nimue. You know, her influence made him a better person that, you know, because he was always a very selfish person. And it was it wasn't until her influence that put him on the right path, you know, to become maybe who he's destined to be, you know, who he's not able to see it, you know, because for him, it's just like. Because he even has that conversation with Morgana later on about the fact that it matters. He feels like unless you have a title in land, who who are you? You know, because like he grew up because having to carry the weight of his father's debts, like basically carrying his father's bad reputation around with him. Like it led him, you know, leaving made, made him grow up to become who he was. Maybe if things were different, like if they were different circumstances, he probably would have grown up a little bit more honorable. Even though there is honor there, he had shown instances of it, you know. When it came to that Boris dude or helping out um, Nimue, despite her being a face, so that already showed you he didn't have the same prejudice so many other people did, you know? So there was already stuff there. It's just like his need to prove himself to be something, to be somebody, you know? Um, that need it kind of outweighed any true honor he had, you know? Because he felt like unless he had a name and a title, he had no honor. You know, so I just thought that was kind of a complicated, interesting thing. And once again, kind of circling to the Morgana thing, I thought was interesting. It's because I, once again, Merlin kind of screws me up uh, because of her story and that. Like, that's why I was kind of confused at first. I was like, oh, you don't have magic in this? But then the the, uh, the Kiliak whole situation about it being like, oh, you'll be one of the most powerful sorcerers. I was like, yeah, I thought so. So I was like... So is she just a regular... I was like, that's what kind of, kind of confused me. I was like, are you just... So are you just a regular human then? I was like, then... Because, like, once again, Merlin's probably definitely... Once again, I keep making that misconception. Like, Merlin's kind of its own thing. So, like, I... Once again, I know a little bit about Morgana. But a tiny bit I know is very minimum. And then, like, everything else I know is mainly taken from the show, you know, um, uh, Merlin, where she was played by uh, Katie McGrath. Um, but regardless... Like, I just thought that was kind of interesting where her story started at, like her being at that, you know, um, would monastery be the right word? Probably not monastery. Um, and, oh, I, I got to talk about it. That Iris kid, I knew from the beginning, I was like, just the stank look on her face the moment she met, um, once again, nothing against the actress or anything like that. It's just character-wise, the, the the look of disdain, and she's like looking at a demon. You can see, you can see, they might have the face of human, but you can look at them long enough. It's just like the way she was staring them way down. You're just like, oh, that kid's going to be an asshole. Oh, she super ends up being a super asshole because she literally burns the entire place down with everyone in it because like, oh, they've been so corrupted. It's like. Do you not see the hypocrisy? But, but it's like in her mind, it's like, oh, I am God's, you know, avenging angel, warrior, or whatever. I'm ridding, like, oh, they, they've been tainted. There are people that had absolutely nothing to do with Nimue. Only two people were involved with Nimue. I mean, technically three. You love Celia, Morgana, and like the abbot that kind of ran the. Ab no, because it's, it's a different word for her. She has like, I think it's like abbess. I think it's like the opposite, like an abbot, I think was her rank, which feels so bad for her. And Iris just so easily turned her into like, yeah, because, you know, and then later on, it's like the whole thing about her wanting to be a red paladin. But it's like, oh, bring us the wolf blood witch's head and sure. And it's like, oh, OK. And that's what was so curious, too, is like, how the hell are you just hiding amongst the, the fae and them not noticing? They knew ahead of time about Arthur. So that made me wonder, I'm like, this... Does she, actually, she talks a little bit about her history because I think she talked about the fact is I think when it, like her dad murdered her mom in front of her. So I was like, you can go like, OK, so she felt like she was lost and broken and the church basically fixed, you know, she became she needed something to believe in and she became an extremist like. I mean, it doesn't seem like it's just allocated to the Red Paladins. It seems like the church in general is very extremist in this time and stuff like that. But I like maybe that kind of like broke her mentally but the fact is you're kicking it amongst the fae and them not noticing it they, they sure as hell call arthur out for being man blood so i'm like why did they never call her out so that's why i'm like does she is she actually more is she actually a fae is she kind of self-hating like is she actually a fae and she doesn't realize it that's what i'm gears about same thing about pim because pim kept being like i'm not a fae which but then i, I think the whole iris thing was her just saying that because either Either one, she can actually sniff out other Faye and she just never really realized it. Or two, that was just her saying that because like, oh, you lay, like it's that whole like, 
you know, it's like, oh, you lay down with Faye, Faye, you're with Faye, blah, 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 you know, like her bigoted, like, you know, perspective on the whole situation. So I feel like it leans more towards, like, it's just her being like, oh, you're cool with the Faye, screw you. But man, I just I just get this inkling, like I said, it's just like, how could she roll amongst the Faye and then not really give her the same shit they gave Arthur, you know? Because even those other Faye, like, rolled up to her. So that made me think, like, she has to be something more, right? She has to be, like, part of Faye or something. Like, you know? Because I even like that twist when we get revealed that the Weeping Monk is one. But I had a feeling for a while he had to be one. Because I'm like, you being able to... He's literally sniffing out other Faye. I'm like, you have to be a Faye. So, like, why are you hunting your own kind? But I guess it's like... Basically, you were beaten into submission. Like, every everyone you cared about was murdered around you. You were spared because it's like, oh, I need you to sniff out other Fey, and it's like, as all the scars on his back, I'm assuming those were either self-inflicted, kind of like Da Vinci Code level wise, or maybe it's more so like, uh, Cardin did that to him to break him, to submit him, to be like, you know, and that's so sad that he would turn against his own people, just you know. But to be fair, it's like he, who knows how long Cardin had him. It might be a thing of like. Oh, you've been with us since you were a little boy yourself. Maybe that's what kind of resonated with Squirrel when he saw Squirrel. Because like when he saw Squirrel, he probably thought of himself because he was probably the exact same age Squirrel was about, you know, when he lost everything too. So he found a little commonality with that. Maybe that's why he refused to hurt children because he was a child himself when it all happened. So almost like... I couldn't be protected, so I'm going to protect these kids, which even Gwen calls him out for because it's like, oh, you protect the kids, you don't kill them, but you murdered their, their family and friends in front of them, let the Red Paladins run them down with horses, you know, so that's a whole thing. Um, I did like the whole introduction of Gwen and the complicated, almost borderline love triangle that created between Arthur and him. And uh, Nimue, I thought it was kind of neat. Because um, at first when Arthur meets him, it's like, yeah, yeah. But it's just like, I was like, oh, is that going to turn into a love triangle thing? It's like, no. It seems like Gawain even says, I even love that. What was that moment? Uh, they're about to die. It's like that place, is, that farm, that meal or whatever is about to get burned. And Arthur's like, all right, so what are you, what's between you and Nimue? He's like, Gawain's like, are you serious? We're literally about to die in like six minutes and you're bringing this up now. He's like, I need to know whether I'm dying by a rival side or a brother. And it's just kind of like, what, I even love it because it's just kind of like, even Gwen's like, what the, what are you doing good to the situation we're in? And he's like, I need to know. He's like, she's like a little sister to me. And it's like, fine. So if I try to, he's like, fine, if you want to, you can marry twice over. I don't give a damn. Like, fine. And it's like, all right. So we're fighting. This is brothers. I love that. You literally had to take that time. But I, th I get it. It's like, if you're going to die for this, it's like, hey, I want to know, like, hey, you should, am I fighting by a rival side or, you know, am I going to be, you know, by a brother side? And it's like for him to be like, because also it's just got to make things clear. You know, it's just kind of like, you know, if I survive this, I need to know, like, where I stand in this whole thing. Because, you know, despite the complicated nature of like, oh, him betraying Nimue, she forgave him, especially because he helped out, you know. What I'm also curious about is the whole situation with Morgana. Is that kind of supposed to represent, like, everything that she kind of becomes, like, you know... Once again, I have it in my head that maybe she becomes some great evil or something like that. But then it's like, you're the one who gets to decide who becomes king and stuff like that. Which I think is interesting, because, like, that's typically allocated to Merlin, isn't it? So, that, that's like I said, it's a combination... Com combination? combination of once again my limited knowledge of Arthurian lore plus not knowing this book at all you know that this is based on you know because once again I'm sure it remixes things to its own extent um but I, I think it's so interesting like where, what her story became because you could tell like over the course of the season like she started changing because like after the whole um Kaliak situation uh she started to change I even thought that was kind of interesting like how Nimue took from that story because we find out like Oh, basically, there was a whole bunch of people that were almost on the, what were they, the clerics? They were on the, um, they were near death. And basically, the Kaliak was kind of like, oh, I will wipe out your enemies for you. And it does. It basically created a giant fog that basically blanketed the field. And basically, the end, the soldiers turned against each other. And that's why the place is called, what was it, like, Brother's Blood. Because it, brothers ended up spilling each other's blood at there. You know, the fog made them mad and turned against each other. I even loved that later on. She took inspiration from that and used it against the Red Paladins. I thought that was pretty neat. Um, but nevertheless, uh, but then the Kaliak was kind of like, oh, I need a price for all, help you out. Uh, it's all your children. And it's like, huh. And 
I thought was interesting because Nimue started, you know, taking from that story. She was like, maybe a demon didn't realize it. Demons, you know, don't look at themselves as demons. It probably wasn't until it was asking for a price that it realized it was a demon. It's, I think it's basically her way of going like, you don't know like how far you've fallen off the path that you might have become a monster or something until it's too late. Because I think for her, it's like she never thought much about it until, you know, more time happened. She spent more time with the sword, hearing what, you know, Merlin had to say, doing what she's done, like killing the Red Paladins like that. and made her kind of fear that power because it's just like who am, you know... Because for her, she didn't want to just lead people because she's like, what am I going to do? Lead people into more bloodshed and death? Like, I, I, I can't do that. Because for her, it's like she started all this not with the mission of becoming Queen of the Fae. It's like, I started this with like my mother's dying wish for me to take this sword to Merlin. And that was the question. We never actually got a full concrete answer. Why did she want him to take, did she want, um her to take it to Merlin. Was it was it what Merlin surmised? Like, oh, she figured I would be a better person and that I would do what was right with the sword because obviously his plan was to destroy it. Um, now, whether that was, you know, I feel, because that's an interesting thing. Like, obviously he, he got, he ended up getting a faith fire and everything, so he's willing to destroy it. The question would always be, would he have actually done it given a chance? Like, would the sort of tempting would have been too much? Because obviously we know how seduced he can get by the sword, how seducing the sword can be in general. So it begs the question, like, when a time came, would he have done it? I think he would have, but there's also part of me that's kind of like, honestly, I don't know. Like, part of me wonders, would he have actually done it in the end? I mean, obviously, and I think that's kind of an interesting thing about Merlin. He is such a slippery snake, especially because he doesn't have magic. So he's to the point, like, he has to lie and cheat his way through so many things, being like, oh, I could do this and do that. It's like, yeah, you could have, but you didn't. You didn't turn these people into mole rats or whatever. So it makes you wonder, are the 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 story's true that you no longer have your magic, you know? Um... You know, having to deal with the whole Uther situation, which that ended up being interesting, especially when we ended up learning the uh, secret behind his upbringing that even he doesn't have rightful claim to the throne because he's not even legitimately a um, a pin dragon. Uh, he's actually like the son of some uh, a woman named Sylvia um, who gave birth. And basically, his quote-unquote mother ended up killing his real bio mom. And basically, the midwife was hidden away because it, I guess it's always been Merlin's insurance policy. I wonder why he chose now out of any time to cash that in. I mean, granted, he I mean, it makes sense why now. But, like, why not before now? Like, I guess there's never been any instance dire enough where he needed it. Um, which is actually kind of sad in the end. Um, speaking of that whole Uther thing, it's interesting because it's like... When his mom, when the queen mother died, she was smiling. And I was like, is she actually kind of proud of him? Because I think for her, maybe in that instance, like, oh, you being bloodthirsty. Well, not bloodthirsty, but you doing this, going out of your way like this. I guess for her, it's like it shows that he's gotten backbone because he's always kind of caved to whatever she wants. He's never been like the most stern, steadfast leader. And so for her, I mean, and I think this, I mean, we don't know. We've never seen the entirety of his rule. We've only seen this section of it. And it seems like definitely at the end, he became a little more like, because he's almost like a child with a cannon in the sense that like, oh, like he has all this power, but he doesn't know how to properly wield it. He's just a child on the throne, I guess, never really given a chance to really grow because I guess he always kind of had to bend to, because he always listened to Merlin. So he never really had much faith and belief in himself, plus his mother's doubt and stuff like that. I think all that kind of made him a little meekish to a certain extent. But I think at the very end, he started kind of finding himself, especially after he killed his mom and then killed Merlin. And it was almost like, I mean, in a sense, too, for him, it's like, it was. It, it makes you feel completely because you're like, his mom wasn't the best person, but it's still like, oh, that was your mom. But for him, he was talking about the fact is he was thinking about like, my, my bio mom was only 19 when you killed her. And he's like, who I could have been, what kind of life I could have led if you hadn't done that. But at the end of the day... I am your son. But her smiling made me think, like, I, I think she felt proud. Like, yes, you are mine. Look at you. You'll do great things. I'm so proud of you. I think in that moment, you know, in the grand scheme of things, I thought that was kind of, you know, a fascinating aspect of that whole, you know, situation. Another interesting thing was like the whole Pym subplot. I was curious, like, where that was going to go. Once again, 
probably know something like her name doesn't ring a bell to me i'm like is she someone important like it's just like the way they spent their time like bringing her back to nimue and the fae made me think like i mean for one it's like this is like the only probably other person aside from squirrel that comes from well Gwen too because i think he's sky folk as well because obviously they've known each other so like he's a part of that world so they're the only three people she knows connected that to that that survived everything um but, like, the whole thing of her kicking it with the Raiders slash the Red Spears. Uh, well, first, she ended up spending time with Aaron, who was the dude she was going to be engaged to. And he was sticking up for her. And it's like, no, she's going to practically be your daughter, mom, so she's staying here. And I love and I love that she wasn't speaking after everything until Aaron brought that up. She was like, wait, what? 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 Like, that's what got her talking after she was, like, traumatized after everything she'd been through. But then she met, what is it, Doff? And um, then she found herself being the healer, her boasting, being like, oh, yeah, like, I'm the greatest healer, like, for my village and several other villages. I even love later on when she's, you know, sewing up the uh, Red Spear. She's like, you're a shit healer, but hey, you're saying, like, let's go after the paladins. They're the one with the gold. It works out from the first time. I mean, who knows how many times they actually did it, but the last time they did it, it didn't work out for them too well. The paladins ended up overpowering them. Because, I mean, like, well, for when the paladins were in a position where, like, a lot of people kind of resonated with what they believed in, sadly, they kind of, they, you know, bolstered the fear that a lot of people in general fell. So a lot of their numbers got bolstered from, like, people being like, yeah, we'll join you. Like, oh, yeah, burn the witches, burn all this and that. And I think that's, like, an interesting thing. I guess because, like, witch is, like, a derogatory term in this world. Because, like, she doesn't consider, like, she doesn't consider herself a witch. I guess because, like, because witches in, like, it's kind of used in the way it is. Like, I just thought that was, I mean, I guess hell, even real life-wise, like, witch can be seen as a derogatory term, I guess, just because, especially, like, oh, you got burned at the stake for being a witch, you know, in the Salem witch trials and stuff like that. I mean, obviously before then, but still. Um, but so I guess for her, it's just like, oh, I'm sky folk, I'm fae. Like, that's where I, but it's just like, because she has magic and stuff like that, but, um, I wonder, I'm, I'm assuming, I wonder, because, like, she doesn't do, well, she does some, like, fate incantations, because her and her mom do that to kind of heal and stuff like that, but I don't think it's on the same level as, like, Merlin, like, where his magic originates from, um, like, it doesn't seem like it calls upon the hidden, because he uses, like, he does actually use magical incantations, but, but there have been instances where you see, like, he does magic, well, the few times he's able to do magic over the course of the season, because that's stuff in the past, he didn't need incantation. So, the more powerful the spell is, the more ch energy he's channeling. Um, so, that's why I'm wondering, like, does his power come from a different lane? Well, obviously, like, Nimue's got to come from the same power as well, considering the fact that that's his kid. So, but to be fair, she probably has a fraction of his power. Maybe, maybe not. Like, it, you know, there's still a lot, a lot about that whole situation that we are ultimately unclear about, you know? I should also note, I really like the, the development of the Weeping Monk, what his story ended up being. Um, especially, it was, like... I like the reveal about who he is and being Lance a lot. I had a feeling it took, I, I'm sure there's other people who probably jumped on this sooner. It wasn't until he started talking, like when Gwen was captured by the Red Paladins and being tortured. It wasn't until the Weeping Monkey him talked, I was like, you're, you're freaking, you're freaking Lance a lot, aren't you? Like, especially, I think it wasn't until like later on when like, uh, he referred to Squirrel as Percival. I was like, oh, the knight. And I was like, well, I know you're Gwen. So I'm like, and so I was like, He's going to be Lance a lot, isn't he? I was like, come on. But then, like, he started getting beat up by, like, the Trinity Guard later on. I was like, oh, maybe he's up. But then he pulls through the moment Squirrel was like, fine, you you know, who wants it first? And I think that inspired him because it's like this kid's willing to put... Once again, like, I think he sees himself, you know, in uh, uh, Percival. But the moment at the end when he was like, oh, what's your name? He's like, Percival. And it's like, do you have a name? He's like... And I was like, go ahead, see, I was like, go ahead, I, I dare you. And he was like, Lancelot, I was like, I fucking knew it. I stood up and I screamed. I was like, I fucking knew you were Lancelot. Him being skilled, the fact is Gwen called him out, being like, yeah, you're a very a skilled warrior and everything. I was like, he, I knew he had to be, damn it, Lancelot. That's so interesting. That's going, and that's, that's the interesting setup about this because like, obviously we're seeing the, you know, aspects of the Knights of the Round Table. You got your Percival, you got your Lancelot, you got your Gwen. So I'm like, okay. So, which makes the question, where does, like, well, I was about to say, it makes me wonder, well, because there's a whole Arthur and Nimue situation, because I was like, because doesn't he end up with 
Guinevere? Isn't that who he, he ends up with? Once again, I, I'm basing this on uh, Merlin, and I might be... Once again, it's been years since I've seen it, too, so I'm remem not remembering well, but I'm like... That's why it's, it's almost that sad situation where, like, well, because, once again, this is kind of its own thing, but it's almost like, you know, he's going to end up with her in the end, won't he? Like, he's going to end up with someone else as his queen. Um, once again, this is kind of a remix. This is kind of its own, you know, retelling and, you know, once again, remix of the sto Arthurian story, so who, who knows, but... um. I just thought that was kind of interesting, especially like where this starts him out of being like, oh, he was the enemy. He's killed a lot of Faye. Like, he's responsible for a lot of death, you know? So, but even like, you know, because even Gwen at the end was like, you're one of us. You all, you'll be my brother. And so he's like, you know, I pray for you, you know? Um, so it's interesting that in the end, like, you know, so is he going to be welcomed? Easily amongst the Fae? No, because he helped hunt and kill a lot of Fae. Regardless if he's a Fae or not, they look at um, Merlin as a traitor, so they're definitely going to look at him like one, too. But obviously, Percival will probably be the one to kind of sway things more in his favor. But I just thought that was kind of interesting. Like, we're seeing, like, the groundwork kind of in the foundation. You know, I'm sure, like, every if you're, like, an Arth like Arthurian nut about all of this stuff, like, I'm sure you're losing your damn mind about it. Especially if you've read... The, the you know once again the novel that this is based on um this obviously you know cursed in particular you know that this is being adapted from um you probably like know like you probably know the groundwork of where everything is going to end up i'm sure that obviously between the book and this there's um a lot of changes i should also know i really like the like for one i like the opening how it's stylized and also like how they use that as a transition between scenes and stuff like that it kind of, that transitioning actually kind of answers a question I had about Morgana, because it seemed like she killed, um, the widow, who's basically, I was like, so you basically killed death, didn't you? Because it seems like that's her thing, like, she knows when people are about to die, and she comes to them when, then. Because it's interesting, because she said from the very beginning of the season, like, she told, uh, Merlin that when it's all said and done, the path he's going down, she's like, don't do this, because if you do, it's going to lead down a path you're going to regret, you're going to wish death upon, it's going to be something so terrible, and, you know, at the moment it starts leaning towards, like, oh, Nimue potentially dying, like, that's where I think it started being like, okay, so this is what she was representing, um, but even then, I think she's, because, like, we learned a little bit about the Shadow Lords, but she's the only one we've met. So there are obviously others, and I guess they kind of represent, like, everything. Because I guess the widow represents death, but maybe there's one that represents time and something like that, you know? Well, you'd assume maybe the widow kind of represents that. Well, like, we know, once again, she's the only Shadow Lord we met. But, like, during the transition, it showed the sword um, going through her, like, mouth. So it's almost like, I guess, at the last second, like... She and that's that's what I'm wondering too. Like, did the Kaliak account for that? Like, was this the way things were supposed to go? Did she put Morgana in this position to be here? Like, was this all obviously you're using Celia as a means to kind of manipulate her, but obviously it's like this, uh, Celia, um, Kaliak also gave her sight. It's like you should be able to see what, like, because I think I guess because also as a human, she shouldn't be able to see that, but I think it's like. I guess Merlin's a special case himself because I guess he was amongst the Shadow Lord, so maybe that's what allows him to see her and make dealings and talk to her and stuff like that, you know? So, that's just kind of an interesting development. Uh, how that, like, manifests itself like that. I'm just curious, you know, to see what that kind of all means for Mor Morgana at the end. I mean, obviously, she's become the powerful sorcerer, and, you know, it kind of makes sense, you know? But, like, that's what I'm wondering is it's like, the Kaliak did it want why did it put her in this position is it just because it, it wanted her to fulfill her destiny is there more to it like is it going to get something out of this because it seems like it's like oh I hope you get here but there's a price to pay you just don't know it yet you know so that begs you know a lot of you know those questions as well I also love that, like, Father Cardin wasn't, like, the all-powerful person he kind of thought he was. That he was basically some schmuck. Because there's a whole thing with, um... 
Merlin basically being like, oh, I know where you're from. You basically joined the church because you need the, an excuse to get out of your town, essentially. So it's like, it's not like you're coming at this with the most righteous, you know, uh, position and stuff like that. And I just thought that was kind of like a fascinating aspect. But it's also like the way like he gets punked by the Pope. The Pope is just kind of like, it's like. You know, the whole kissing the ring thing, obviously, I'm sure that there's some validity to that, just probably even real world wise. But I think it's just like the Pope putting him in his place and then even that abbot later on, like, you know, he's like, oh, this, you know, Father Carlin, like, did everything because he felt the need to prove himself. It's like it wasn't just like, oh, God gave me this position. It's like, no, he needed to prove himself because he wasn't anyone special. And I think he was looking to be someone special. Uh I'm glad he got it as hard as he did at the end. Not only in one fell swoop did you lose your hand, you also lost it, lost your head at the same time. Like I, th I was like, you got your just desserts. Like all the death and carnage you've caused, all the people you've hurt. You know, you. Um, it was only befitting. You know, it's just kind of like he kind of you know got his just desserts. You know, at the end of the day, I did also like the complicated like political angle that was in this uh, show with the situation of Uther and uh, Coomber, like that whole situation of like this, like, you know, legitimacy for the throne battle and stuff like that. And, you know, Merlin going to Coomber being like, oh, here, I can basically tell you everything about Uther to kind of know his claim to the throne about the whole, like, the whole story from the midwife, which I even felt bad because her entire family got murdered by the fishermen who was coming after Merlin. When he got, when the fisherman got got at the beginning of the episode, I was like, oh, I thought that would have dragged on a little bit more. Like, all this stuff you've been doing, and then, like, Merlin just got you. To be fair, Merlin was being poisoned and stuff like that from the era, but I was just like, oh, you've been this big bad, you've been looming in the shadows, and then, bam, you got Merlin. It's like, damn, oh, man, you saying, like, I would have done this for free. Oh, boom, Merlin actually got you. I was like, oh, and it was, and then, the opening title cards roll. I was like, oh, I didn't expect you to go down. I thought there was going to be more with you. I thought maybe this would have stretched out over the episodes. I was like, nah, you're done. You're done before. You're the, you're part of the cold opening. I was like, oh, that was, that was interesting. Um, obviously, there's still the whole Rugen thing because he still wants Merlin dead just because, like, oh, you, you backstabbing bastard. You made me think I was going to get the sword. So uh, there's that. But, um, because the sad thing is, at the end of the day, Nimue's in this position where she's, like, obviously trying to defend her people. Obviously, once again, the sword kind of seducing, not only the sword, but even Morgana being like, no, fight. Rip them to shreds and slice them. They're like, oh, jeez, Morgana, like, when you become, like, all bloodthirsty and everything. But it's a situation of, um, she wants to do what she believes is best for the Fae, you know, even sacrificing herself, you know, kind of. Obviously, Arthur was, kind of, you know, completely against that. But I think at the end of the day, you know, he wouldn't respect her wishes, especially she's asking him to be the one that looks after the Fae and everything. But it's like, it's, and I, I like that aspect to her story. It's like, it's not the fight she started out this. Once again, she just wanted to fulfill her mom's dying wish and she found herself queen leading a people trying to make sure that they survive you know the whole thing of like was it Grimir like they ended up there that whole complicated thing and you have like uh, Morgana and um, Arthur's uncle kind of being a piece of crap um, we never actually, actually got to see him after everything got settled in Grimir. Like, I mean, once everything was kind of settled, she left, and, like, everyone there was just humans. So I'm curious to see what that might mean for the future. Maybe it means something, maybe not. Like, I'm sure, like, oh, the Red Paladins are going to come up to us, you know. Ramification is going to fall back on them for them being occupied by, um, by the, um, jeez, by the Fae and everything. Um, I'm curious to see what that kind of looks like. You know, at the end of the day, but obviously, like you know, Arthur and like him with, because um, the dude who got his hand sliced off for killing a human, um, when it was all said and done, like his people wanted weren't going to listen to, uh, wasn't going to listen to uh, Nimue, but Arthur was like, "Don't be stupid. You want to be, you want legacy, you want your legacy to live on, your grandchildren to hear about you being strong and wise. Like, are you really going to put the lives of your people before? Are you going to put your pride before your people?" And he's like, "Blood has to be paid with blood." He's like, "Fine." Arthur held out his arms. It's like, "You want blood? If it means saving your stupid life, 
fine, I'll do it, you know, and, but he's like, fine, he's like, you know, you're still a fool regardless, but he reluctantly, you know, takes Arthur's aid, and it's like, you know, they get out there, I was worried, I was like, Uther's gonna backstab him, but the ships ended up coming, I was like, oh, it's gonna work out, but then, like, Coomber had joined forces with the, um, Red Paladins, and, you know, they ended up, you know, attacking, luckily, the Red Spear showed up in time, and, because obviously Red Spear has her connection because she talks about the fact that she belonged to Coomber's court, but um, now it's filled with traitors. Because I guess like she's the one that feels like she has uh, validity to the throne. Because I'm assuming like she's got by birthright type of situation. Like he's he's a cousin to the real true pin. Like he's a cousin to the real pin dragon. So I guess she feels like she has even more claim on the throne than Coomber does. So for her, that's what this is all about. Which is interesting considering like you're joining forces with Arthur. He owes you, you owe him a debt because he ended up helping you when he shot down the lady you're trying to kill um because i guess she's trying to kill any i guess that's her family because i think that's coomber and that's his two daughters the one that died on the battlefield and the one that uh that's with him um the one that was telling her not to join forces with the blood uh, wolf blood witch um which is so interesting that it ended up being the name that carried her but i guess it's like just the way she viciously murdered those wolves and stuff like that that that's what the name that ended up uh carrying over for her but um, there's also an interesting situation when obviously she got Gawain back. Um, she ended up kind of releasing this large amount of power and then she ended up passing out. But then like Gawain was starting to light those leaves and stuff like that. I might be confusing it, but wasn't Gawain the one that was brought back for like an episode in the original show? Uh, and, and I say in the original show in Merlin because I think it was a thing of like, um, or I, I might be confusing it with a different night. Because he had a whole relationship with Guinevere and, um, it turned to a whole thing where, like, he, he was brought back to life, but then he was, like, m killed. It was, it was a whole thing. I'm trying to remember if that was him. So I'm wondering, like, if that was him, is, like, is that Gwen's story? Does he always die and come back? Is he the knight that came back? Is that going to be his story? Like, because, like, the... Because she wasn't even able to help Dolph, but part of me wonders, like, in that instant when she summoned all that power, was she able to kind of break the laws of nature, and was she actually able to bring him back? Or, you know, because, like, the fact is that grass grew around him, that's why I'm like, there's got to be more to that, right? Like, the fact is they threw that there and just kind of never showed you the aftermath of that makes you think, like, okay, so what is, you know, to become of that, you know? It is this sad situation where it seemed like despite Morgana becoming, um... Despite Morgana becoming uh, the widow, she still, it seemed like she still didn't see, you know, I guess because for her, she saw Merlin's death, but she didn't see uh, what was to become of um, Nimue. But that begs the question, maybe because Nimue, obviously we know, well, at least it, it seems like she's not dead. So it's like, maybe that's why Morgana didn't see it because like her fate had changed because Morgana had become um, the widow and maybe that changed things, you know, especially because they went out of the way to say because by saving Merlin They changed everything maybe potentially. I don't know. It sucks that Iris ended up being the one to do I was kind of hoping like Like Morgana or Merlin would have killed her like it once again It's so effed, I feel so effed up to say that but it's just like, I'm once again not saying anything terrible about the actor Obviously, I'm talking about just the character and the story itself of like I just want especially when Merlin got the sword start throwing lightning around I'm like You almost hit her come on But it's like no she walks away of like because part of her hair is kind of white now and then like she's got Kind of like lightning burns on her face a little bit that I'm like that's probably significant to people who who know that's probably super significant I should also know I, I don't plan on looking up anything King Arthur related like because I don't want to spoil anything. Once again, this is its own story based on, you know, the book Curse. But I'd still rather not take the chance that I'm going to spoil certain things. Once again, I'm coming in, like I said, I'm coming in there with my preconceived notions. But those preconceived notions are for something else differently. You get what I'm trying to say, so. But it, it sucks, you know. It's just kind of like. But like, because Iris kept trying over and over to kill her but never could, you know. And she almost seems like she almost has this split person. Well, I guess she's talking like God was talking through her because she was like, do it. You kill her, I'm going to burn you, I'm going to burn you. I will. She's like, I'll do it, I'll do it. Like, that's why I'm like, she almost seems like she had a split personality. Once again, 
ramifications from her upbringing, like, once again, her dad, like, murdered her mom, whatever, so it probably broke her mind, but still, it's just kind of like, oh, you suck, but Merlin slashing people through, he, he, my mind immediately went like, oh, he, he super went Raiden, it's kind of interesting, because my mind didn't even immediately go to Thor, it went to Raiden, I don't know, I guess because all the blood and everything immediately made me think of very, like, it seemed very Mortal Kombat-ish, so I think that's why I went there instead of, you know, Norse mythology with, you know, Thor and, you know, Marvel and everything, but regardless, um, he left with Morgana and everything, so, and then we see, like, Iris becoming part of the Trinity Guard, you know, what that means, I was, I was also bummed that the, uh, Lancelot didn't kill that Abbot, I was like, come on, throw your sword at him or something, it's like, ah, oh, the bastard got away, uh, but, um, obviously, like, because of the Red Spears, everything kind of worked out. Uh, for Arthur and them. I'm curious what's going to happen there because obviously Pym's got a connection to the, you know, the, the Red Spears and everything and like what that kind of means for her story. Obviously, once again, like Uther's still out there. Coomber's still out there. Both of them pining for the throne. Um, Cardin might have been taken care of, but obviously, well, I don't think all the Red Paladins are dead. Like all, all only focus we got was on the Trinity Guard. So I'm assuming that they might be like the new Red Paladins. Like they might be the ones going forward. We might not see as many Red Paladins. Maybe we still will. It's just interesting because like because it was more so Father Cardin's thing. I mean, granted, there was a few that were there and that still got wiped out by Merlin. But I'm sure he's on a on a war path of wanting to wipe everybody out because of that. But now that he's got his magic back, like, what does that mean for him? Like, you know, we've seen how easily he can be corrupted by it. You know, and obviously Nimue's fate. I've read something that kind of spoiled what Nimue's fate is in the grand scheme of things from an authorian standpoint. Even I don't know what the hell that means because I'm like, I don't... She, she's revealed to be a certain character and I'm like, I don't know enough. I know a movie. I've seen one movie based on this character and even that movie was a very different adaptation of it so like I don't know but I know this character's connection to the the, the sword and everything but the, the term that I saw was kind of like oh the tragic tale of insert character's name and I was like huh so that's why I'm like oh I guess things don't work out well for that character but it's like what's that mean in the grand scheme of things like what this means for Nimue like you know obviously her being in water kind of leads to that character but i'm like i don't once again i don't know enough about that character even if for like what because it, it doesn't it's not like spoiling it i'm like oh i know that name i've heard it i just don't know that character at all i've never really known their story so what they represent in a, you know in this like i said all three in lore but um obviously plenty of setup for you know uh future season at the time we're recording this, Cursed has not been renewed by, for a second season yet. To be fair, you know, Netflix, like I said, Netflix is weird. Sometimes stuff gets renewed immediately. It depends on the show. Other things, it takes a while, like before you get an announcement of whether or not there's going to be a season two. I'm sure they're looking at the analytics to be like, oh, well, you know, regardless of all that, I'm very, I would very hope to see a second season, second series of this because I'd be so curious to see where they'd go with everything they've set up or things have kind of you know, left off in the, in the grand scheme of things, you know, um, maybe we finally get also take, not only going, taking the story forward, but also take us a little back to kind of let us know how and why things are the way they are. I'm curious, like, what about Jonah? Like, uh, Nimue's dad, like, we know he left when she was young, but it's like, well, is he still out there? Is he still alive? You know, what's that mean for him in the grand scheme of things? Uh, this whole situation with Uther and Coomber and um, this claim to the throne, because even the Red Spear, she's throwing her um, name in the hat. Obviously, we know where Arthur's story take, potentially will take him, but the journey there is still kind of a mystery, obviously. Um, where, where Morgana's fate and the whole Kaliak situation, you know, Celia, like how that all plays out now that she's the widow, you know, what that means for the other Shadow Lords. I mean, she killed one of your own. It's like she's something unnatural. So it's like how she managed to do that. I'm assuming because of the, the sword what allowed her to be able to do something, you know, impossible like that. And then once again, like Merlin has it. So what does that mean for him? You know, because he's going to be the one he knows about Nimue. The others are going to assume Nimue's dead because of what they saw. What I obviously her story is not over. What that looks like in season two. Once again, uh, Percival as well as Lancelot. What that means. Once again, Gawain. Like what that storyline is. A lot of questions. I'd love to get some some answers to in season two. Hopefully, like I said, hopefully there will be a season two. 
But really, that's all I'm going to talk about. So the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, look like to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day, and goodbye.